We certainly can expect a greater sense of urgency from the Truth Commission from now on. Perpetrators of human rights violations go to the Truth Commission to ask for amnesty. But what is in it for the victims? Everyone appearing at a human rights violations hearing requests something of the Commission. Jan Turner prepared this report. If the Commission can succeed and make thorough investigations just to get where my husband is, even if it is his remains, even if he was bent to death, even if we can get, even if we can get his ashes, even if it is the bone belonging to his body. This simple plea for the return of a loved one's remains has been echoed by dozens of witnesses testifying before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Among the thousands of requests heard by commissioners are calls for cash handouts, for shelter, for education, for medical care, for counselling, and often for plain justice. All these requests are referred to the Committee on Rehabilitation and Reparation whose task it is to decide who qualifies for relief and how that relief should be provided. We are looking for measures which will restore people's dignity, uh, which has been lost. We, we, we felt we need, um, we are looking for measures which will somehow assist people to more or less be able to live a life they would have lived was it not for the violation? I would like to emphasize that we'll always listen and try as much as possible to meet the needs of the people. But what we are going to do is to translate those needs in a way that's going to be viable for the government and in a way that's going to help the national healing of the communities. Also, translate them in such a way that they have a lasting impact to the individual and the communities. To give an example, the, e the easiest way if the government had all the money on earth would have been to dish the handouts to all the people. But the handouts are there when they are finished, people could be back to the same situation. We would not have helped to empower the people and also to create a, a level of, of, of independence. What we are really looking at is to make sure that we plant a seed. We know what is the goal of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's basically to establish partly a culture of human rights, to promote national healing and reconciliation. So obviously, if you give people handouts, irrespective of whether they can be productive or assisted to survive, or enter the market in society. We are looking at possibilities of doing, of, 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 of in putting in place those measures which we know that will benefit not only those individuals or these generations, but other generations to come. Like if you put money in a scholarship in the name of a person who was killed, an often repeated request is that memorials should be created to commemorate those who died. South Africa is already littered with monuments, so how might the Commission approach the design of a memorial to those who suffered during the apartheid years? I think monuments can be live monuments, they can be dead monuments. And a dead monument is something that's got no vitality and meaning in itself. It's just a big pile of stones. And I think of all the ceremonies you find in Europe and other countries where there have been many dead, they commemorated. They have no meaning really for the people. They just block the streets. Uh, they're quite useful as traffic uh, signs. If you want to know where to go, you turn left at that memorial uh, and so on. Uh, the other kinds of, of monuments that, are, that have a living, breathing, uh, very human quality in the very nature, it can be a building itself, Robben Island, uh, and the prison on Robben Island is such a, a powerful monument. You don't have to do anything, you just have to preserve it. Once when I was in Bloemfontein, I, I hadn't been very long back, and I had about two hours to spare, and my host said, well, what would you like to do? And just like an intuition welled up, and I said, please take me to defer a monument. 
The first thing I saw was a statue to Balangskap, uh, that, that's exile. I'd just come back from exile. I could identify. It was another section of society, another community, another historical period that had been sent into exile. But the experience of exile is the same. So I identified very, very strongly uh, with this, what to me was a very authentic memorial to real pain, real suffering uh, of real individualized human beings. Some months later, when I was in Pretoria, I asked to see the, I went to Furtrecker Monument, and my reaction was completely different. To me, this was a monument to power, not, not to suffering, not, it, it lacked a human scale. The sense I had would be that this was a monument not to acknowledge what had happened in the past, but to mobilize people for political purposes. Well, that was my subjective reaction. But there's a third kind of monument, and that is something specially constructed to enable people to mourn, to remember where they can go. And perhaps the most, the finest example of that is the Vietnam War Dead Monument uh, in Washington. Instead of putting up a big, imposing uh, lumps of concrete with all sorts of dazzling features and so on, it, it's a very simple sort of subway into which you walk. And you just see the names of the thousands of American soldiers who died there. And it means that the families can come and they can trace the names of their relatives. It, it doesn't impose a judgment. It doesn't defend the sending of American troops to Vietnam. It simply recognizes the futility and stupidity of war and the terrible loss of life. And being so simple and being so intimate and so accessible to people, somehow it has a wonderfully soothing effect and yet there's a sense of nobility to it. It's an example of what I feel a good monument should be. But beyond remembering, the challenge now facing the Reparation and Rehabilitation Committee will be to meet the expectations of the thousands who have come to them asking for help.